and purge. From our earliest years, we are dissatisfied with our age. When we are children, we envy the freedom of adults to manage their own lives. As teenagers, especially, we chase after restrictions imposed on us as we seek autonomy in ways constructive and rebellious. Those of us who make the transition to adulthood, usually, but not always, in our early 30s, early 20s, are still confronted with the task of earning a living and finding someone we imagine we will still love in our 30s and beyond. Somewhere in this phase of our lives, we begin to worry about aging. Our child's fighting words this morning are from Dr. Gordon Livingston. The common perception of the elderly is that after retirement, they are no longer productive and are reduced to the role of consumers. A patient once described the process of aging this way, quote, it's like climbing a steep hill with failing strength while someone gradually adds rocks to your path, unquote. The rocks are the losses we inevitably accrue as we age, our youth, our physical attractiveness, our health, those we love. The feeling that time passes more quickly as we age is not an illusion. As we grow older, each increment of time makes up a smaller percentage of our lives. We light our chalice with the courage needed to decide that our hopes for a life of meaning matter more than our fears of aging. Please um, rise in body and your spirit and join me for our affirmation of covenant, followed by the doxologies, which Kathy will sing. Love is the doctrine of this church, the quest for truth is our sacrament, and service is our prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve others in community. To the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with creation, thus to be covenant with one another. He pulled 
all the food out of the refrigerator, and he took his mother's watch and flushed it down the toilet. Sometimes his mother would say, You're a girl, but it's not your turn.
You can learn more about our church by going to our website, unionchurchlc.org. If you are visiting us today, we'd like to meet you. Please rise and body your spirit and introduce yourself, giving us your name, where you're from, and how you heard about the church. We don't have a traveling mic at this time, so please speak up as loudly as you can. Do we have any visitors today? My name is Mark, and I'm from Las Cruces. Welcome. I'm Carlos Price in Galveston, Texas. Welcome. Is there anyone else here today? Anybody on Zoom today that would like to introduce themselves as a visitor? Thank you. We are glad that you're here with us. Um, please, if you haven't filled out a visitor, visitor's card um, or if you're on Zoom, um, put your <coughs> information in the chat box. Um, and that's true for if you're a shy visitor and did not want to introduce yourself, we ask you to please do the same so we can contact you for, for future church activities. Directly following this service, there will be a time to fellowship with one another during the coffee hour hosted by the Hospitality Committee. They have crafted a new normal based on credible research and recommendations so that the time to meet and greet one another extends our focus on keeping us all healthy. For now, members of the Hospitality Committee will serve us refreshments which we can enjoy outside in the fresh air. To help keep things simple, the Hospitality Committee requests that, for now, we do not bring our homemade baked goods. One of the safe opening recommendations is to not share food for multiple households, as we have done in the past for coffee hours and potlucks. We are eager to reconnect and be in one another's presence again. Our eagerness may feel softened or stymied a bit sometimes as we adjust to multiple changes. It is important though to keep in mind that the new normals we are adopting are all in place to support our communal attempts to safeguard one another. I have several announcements this morning, so keep your ears perked right up. First, from Katie Fitzgerald, from the, uh, the chair of the auction committee. Join in the fun at the Pancake Breakfast and Fall Auction on Saturday, October 30th, 9 to noon. Please note that this date is a new one. Donations for events, services, baked goods, meals, and gift certificates are the fundamental essential components of the auction. September 30th is the deadline for turning in all donation forms. Auction events are fun and build congregational relationships. Some ideas, host a themed dinner, a happy hour, or a game or movie night. Provide a service, make and deliver a meal, or provide dessert several times during the year. Have a truck, offer to haul discarded items, offer organizational help or pet sitting. Ask your favorite mechanic, hairdresser, manicurist, or restaurant if they'll donate a gift certificate to the auction. Please drop off all completed donation forms in the lobby, in our library, or via email by the 30th. Thanks to all who have already put in their donation forms. If you have any, any questions, you can contact Katie Fitzgerald. Her information is in the directory from uh, the chair of our social justice committee, Dave Rice. Our church has joined 15 other organizations and individuals supporting the Tents to Rents campaign uh, the fundraiser this fall. Please help reach our commitment of at least $1,000 in support of this Mesilla Valley Community of Hope campaign. Mesilla Valley Community of Hope is a multi-program organization which offers services of all kinds 
to homeless individuals and families. You may give by visiting the church's website, look for the social justice um, uh, fund and the tents to rents sub fund. You may also give directly to the website for the Messiah Valley Community of Hope, look for tents to rent, and then the designation line for members of this church. If you prefer, you may contribute by check, uh, put tents, tents to rent in the member line and send your check to the church office. Thank you for contributing to this important campaign, which helps some of the homeless men and women in Las Cruces move from a tent to an apartment. The church received a request from Les Harris, the chair of EduMed.org, during National Suicide Prevention Week, which ended last Saturday. He requested that we add a link to our website, especially for healthcare providers, giving them information about recognizing the warning signs for potential suicidal behavior. He noted that suicide among Healthcare workers and medical students are significantly higher compared to the general population, and the added stress provide, um, caused by the pandemic is making matters even worse. That's why it's crucial that these uh, help that these healthcare providers and students know how to spot the early warning signs and where to turn for help until it's too late. And that's what this organization does. As noted in the service two weeks ago, one action of immediate witness adopted in General Assembly in June was entitled the COVID-19 Pandemic Justice Healing Courage. In keeping with this charge to action, Reverend Pachilla agreed to have the link provided by Mr. Harris added to our website. It will be under um, coping in um, the the link for, for the you know, for current crisis. A special announcement from Dave Steele about our upcoming worship service on Sunday, October 3rd. That's two weeks from today. This service will be a Zoom only service at 10 a.m. The church sanctuary will not be open that day. This service, the blessing of animals, is being planned by the Social Justice Committee Animal Advocates Ministry. The Reverend Russell Elevan, the UU Animal Ministry Chaplain, will be our guest minister. Again, there will be no in-person service at um, the church on Sunday, October 3rd. Join us via Zoom from, from the comfort of your own homes. And we won't even know if you're wearing your PJs. <laughs> Come celebrate our seventh UU principle and our bonds with the non-human animals in our interdependent web of existence. Fall is just around the corner, and that means stewardship season is approaching. You will be receiving letters and pledge cards in the mail in the next few weeks as we gear up for this year's financial campaign to support the health and work of our church for the coming year. Let's set our sails for 2022. On a more personal note, Bill Fitzgerald's mother, Marion Johnson Fitzgerald, died in her sleep last Wednesday. She was 93 and was living in her own home. Bill Huber uh, from the caring team passed on to me that Bill and Katie say they do not need anything specific at this time. They have plans to travel to where Marion lives in November and they may need help then with housing. Thank you all for being here today. Please rise in body and spirit and join in humming as Kathy sings, there's a river flowing in my soul. There's a river flowing in my soul.
We had our AC system in here renovated also, and now we have too much wind. <laughs> Invite you for a moment of prayer and meditation. God of many names and mystery beyond all our naming, we come together in this beloved community, lifting up all those things that are right and joyous and beautiful and loving in our world. Thank you for the compassion that exists amongst people gathered here and those around this community and pray that we will continue to be steadfast in our love and compassion towards others, especially during this COVID time. Help us to help those or the variant. But pray for those families, those individuals who are sick and hospitalized for healing and wholeness and wellness. Pray for all those who are bereaved, lonely, depressed, dealing with mental illnesses, homelessness, struggling for social justice, equality, those sitting in the borderlands, in encampments, hoping for administrative immigrative justice and for women's reproductive justice in the light of the Texas ruling just recently, and for voter justice in light of, again, more suppressive action around the country. You know, people are suffering beyond our walls beyond this town of Las Cruces, throughout the world, there is suffering going on in a variety of forms. And then we do all we can to alleviate that. Pray for our families, our youth, our children. I ask this prayer into the silence. I ask this prayer and meditation in the name of all persons present and absent, known and unknown, remembered and forgotten, and all helpers of humankind. May we say in unison, Amen, Amen. Amen. so, and I share. Have two sermon readings this morning. The first is from Dr. Atoll Gawangi in his, from his book, Being Mortal, Illness, Medicine, and What Matters in the Event. He writes, at least two kinds of courage are required in aging and sickness. The first is courage to confront the reality of mortality, the courage to seek out the truth of what is to be feared and what is to be hoped. Search courage is difficult enough. We have many reasons to shrink from it, but even more daunting is the second kind of courage, the courage to act on the truth we find. The problem is that the wise choice is so frequently unclear. For a long time, I thought that this was simply because of uncertainty. When it is hard to know what will happen, it is hard to know what to do. But the challenge I've come to see is more fundamental than that. One has to decide whether one's fears or one's hopes are what should matter most. The second reading is from an essay written by Henry Miller in the early 1970s. He was, he had celebrated his 80th birthday prior to this essay, reflecting on the art of living. 
If at 80, you're not disabled, if you have your health, if you still enjoy a good walk, a good meal, with all the trimmings, if you can sleep without first taking a pill, if birds and flowers, mountains and seas still inspire you, you are a most fortunate individual. And you should get down on your knees morning and night and thank the good Lord for his saving and keeping power. If you are young in years, but already weary in spirit, already on the way to becoming an automaton, it may do you good to say to your boss under your breath, of course, forget you, Jack, you don't owe me. If you can fall in love again and again, if you can forgive your parents for the crime of bringing you into the world, if you are content to get nowhere, just take each day as it comes. If you can forgive as well as forget. If you can keep from growing sour, surly, and bitter, and cynical, then you've got it. Our anthem should be a video um, by Bill Withers of Grandma's Hand. I hope this one works. If, if it doesn't, look it up on YouTube um, <laughs> because it's, it's a really wonderful video. I'm one of those very lucky uh, people who I'm one of those very lucky uh, people who was born in a very small place where everybody knew everybody. One person that everybody knew as grandma happened to be my real grandmother. And I held that high uh, position of being grandma's number one person in the whole world. I could do anything. Grandma would say, don't y'all hit that baby. That's grandma's baby. Grandma had a way of sneaking up behind you when you weren't looking and laying an old piece of uh, candy on you that had been laying around her room for about six or eight months or so. And Grandma had a more useful side. At that time, uh, contraceptives weren't too well known in that area. And a lot of times, young girls would be uh, expecting uh, children without the uh, benefit of having husbands. And they would always come to Grandma and sit on the floor at Grandma's feet. And Grandma would rub their heads and say, I'm going to pray for you, baby. I guess Grandma's prayers went where mine and yours and everybody else's go. But it seemed like Grandma could just pray a disease right out your body. <clears throat> I really, really dug my grandmother. church on Sunday morning, Grandma's hands played a tambourine so well, Grandma's hands used to issue out a warning, she'd say, Billy, don't you run so fast, might fall on a piece of glass, might be snakes there in that grass, Grandma.
used to hand me a piece of candy Grandma's hands Pick me up each time I fell Oh, Grandma's hands Boy, they really came in handy She'd say, Matty, don't you whip that boy What you wanna spank him for He didn't drop no apple core But I don't have Grandma anymore If I get to heaven, I'll look for Grandma Yeah. 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 It reminded me of my grandmother, both my grandmothers. I grew up with one of them living in the house with my mother's mother. She died when I was in the ninth grade. And I called my father's mother um, driving when I was probably in fifth grade. And um, the song really brought back some good memories for me. I really well start by my father's. Mother was kind of mean to us. And uh, but she was really a loving person, she was a person that had a lot of witticisms. And whenever I hear people who are very witty, I think of my grandmother. Just last year, Bill Withers died. And uh, Karen and I were going to Alma Gorda last year, and we listened to a great interview with him describing how he grew up in a very difficult situation and uh, went into the Navy. Served in the Navy and then got out, went into um, working to uh, manufacturing and then into music. It was a really beautiful interview. I might post that on the website also so you can just get a sense of the beauty of Bill Withers' life. So thank you, Maggie, for finding that video. Well, today we're talking about aging, and you'll soon hear why. This is a pretty delicate topic, and I realized as I was um, working on this that it may not be as meaningful for people who are in their 30s or 40s or even younger if you're in the audience. So I'm going to ask you to the, kind of bear with me and know that um, in 10 or 15 years, 20 years, it will be something that you're probably thinking about. <laughs> While preparing this sermon, I felt desperate to recall a reference about aging. The source had reported that if you make it to 80 years old, you have won the race of life. So I searched my library and Google for two days straight, just trying to find out where this book was, and I had no success. I knew I hadn't made it up, but maybe I had. Truth be told, I wasn't sure if my search was about proving myself right or proving my memory was still intact. So why did I spend two days wrecking my brain for something that mattered so little? No one is fact-checking my sermons. But something in me insisted that I prove I still had the memory of my youth. But finally, I let it go. My truth-o-meter, pull it off, march the pull the mask off. My truth-o-meter kicked in. Better to keep it 100 with myself be in right relationship with my former self and move on to the next thing. <laughs> I told him the one day describes this as acting on the truth we find. Now, as a new minister, very few people ask me about my age. Ministers often serve into their 80s. And if you look into our Beauty World magazine, our quarterly, that well, was biannual. Um, denominational magazine, you'll meet ministers who serve 40 or 50 years. But people are less accustomed to active military people my age. And when they learn that I'm in the U.S. Air Force or the New Mexico Air National Guard, they often don't hear me or they will second guess what they heard and think that I spoke incorrectly. And people will respond, when did you retire? <laughs> And I respond, I'm still active. And sometimes their unbelief persists and they'll ask me again. But when did you retire, Kalani? Well, I am happy to disabuse them of their ageism. 
And yet it is another reminder to me that people perceive me as old and beyond my useful years. I get it. The movies portray active military as 20 something enlisted soldiers and sailors who fight our nation's wars. And then they retire at age 20. Some people will serve six or seven years and then they get out. But Hollywood centers the band of brothers, not the brothers, senior officers. A funny thing happened last year when my birthday approached. Many of you remember I announced that I was turning 60 and later retracted that when my dear friend Daryl called me to remind me that I was only 59. So I blame Daryl for giving me one extra year of life. And I say that's what best friends are for, giving you a lifeline when you don't know you need one. But the word got out about my early 60th birthday was <clears throat> between there in Albuquerque. The personnel shop scrambled to get me to complete some paperwork to fill out an age extension <laughs> because they knew I was about to be promoted to a full colonel and couldn't make that happen unless I had extended what they call the mandatory separation date. Paperwork is all completed now. <clears throat> Well, I will be 60 for real on Tuesday. And it got me to thinking, when are we really old? And I know this is a touchy topic. Frequently, I hear people describing persons who have passed away. And they'll say, so-and-so died. They were 75. They were still young. And that stirs up my unbelief. It makes me wonder what type of mental gymnastics are required for a person to make that statement. <laughs> As a pastoral counselor, I know that middle age typically is over by 60, and sometimes psychologists will say 65. But people will argue with me and insist that the 75 year old person was still a youngster. All right. <laughs> 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 what is it about age that makes us so defensive, emotional, and irrational? When people ask when I'm retired, I feel a rush of embarrassment. My insides get tense and sometimes shame washes over me. But those feelings are a result of my resistance to accept that People see me as an old fogey, which I am. But that doesn't mean I don't have many good years ahead of me. Now, I describe myself as an old fogey, no one else has to describe myself <laughs> that way. About once a year, I check in with a website known as Death Clock. <laughs> Deathclock.com tells me my personal day of death is September 14th. 2059, which means I have 38 more years to live. <laughs> but that knowledge doesn't wash away the shame or the embarrassment. Only acting on the truth I found does that. Difficult feelings deserve a reckoning. They reveal the limited expectations we internalize as elders. How do we accept our truth o meters verdict and make known our ability to contribute to the greater good beyond those years when our skin wrinkles or our hair grays? When we fall into the unbeliever's trap, we are prone to hold our heads down rather than rise erect and offer unassuming observers a subtle correction. Atul Gawande, the author of the wildly popular Being Mortal, writes, one answer is that old age itself has changed. In the past, surviving into old age was uncommon. And those who did survive served a special purpose as guardians of tradition, knowledge, and history. They tended to maintain their status and authority as heads of their household until death. In many societies, elders not only commanded respect and obedience, but also 
led sacred rights and wielded political power. So much respect accrued to the elderly that people used to pretend to be older than they were, not younger when given their age. He continues saying, people have always lied about how old they are. The Marvelers first calls the phenomenon age keeping and have devised complex quantitative proportions to correct for all the lying in censuses. They have also noted that during the 18th century in the United States and Europe, the direction of our lives changed. Whereas people today often underestimate their age to census takers, studies of the past censuses have revealed that they used to overstate it. The dignity of old age was something which everyone aspired. Does everyone still aspire to old age? I've heard of countless older people, including my mother who died at 96 years old last year, asked over and over, why am I here? One of my favorite writers, Dr. Gordon Livingston, author of Too Soon Old, Too Late Smart, wrote, people often come to me asking for medication. They are tired of their sad mood, fatigue, and loss of interest in things that previously gave them pleasure. They're having trouble sleeping or sleep all the time. Their appetite is absent or excessive. They're irritable or their memories are shot. Often they wish they were dead. They have trouble remembering what it is to be happy. There are certain recurring themes, he goes on to say, Others in their family have lived similarly discouraged lives. The relationships in which they find themselves are either full of conflict or low temperature with little passion or intimacy. Their days are routine and unsatisfying jobs, few friends, lots of boredom. They feel cut off by the pleasures enjoyed by others. He tells them, the good news is we have effective treatments for the symptoms of depression. The bad news is medication will not make you happy. Happiness is the state by which our lives have both meaning and pleasure. We come up with a variety of reasons to avoid acting on the truth we find. A tool who one day argues to maintain meaning and pleasure, we need the courage to confront the reality of mortality. The courage to seek out the truth of what is to be feared and what is hoped for. Such courage is difficult enough, and we have many reasons to shrink from it. You must decide whether your fears or your hopes matter most. Then there's the adage, never ask a woman her age. <laughs> I didn't understand why there was age discrimination between the genders. And why is it that women in movies and TV are filled with filters on the lenses to make them appear young and unblemished, whereas they then film men so that they look true to age. Dr. Michael Finkelstein argues we should strive for wholeness as we age. He defines health as a natural state of wholeness marked by the establishment of dynamic balance, encompassing and fully integrating the areas of our mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, social, and environmental condition. His book, Slow Medicine, poses four key categories, all of which work together for our overall health. They are, one, whether you have a purpose in life, that is, how satisfying and fulfilling your work and life missions are. So you must have life and work missions. The quality of your relationships today. 
How attuned are you with the rhythms of nature? How you maintain your connection to life before and after us? Equal sign holds the 77 questions which will help reveal your whole state of health. And here are three big ones. Are you aware of and able to safely express anger? Do you believe it is possible to change on a fundamental level? Are creative activities a part of your work or leisure time? According to Finkelstein, the answer to these questions are as important as your blood pressure or your weight. I love Finkelstein's approach because he asked, how significant is it to achieve finishing the New York City Marathon if you know you are just running away from lingering childhood pain? You need, and we all need, an holistic approach to aging. In 1939, a 48-year-old Henry Miller wrote an article titled Reflecting on the Art of Living. He concluded how you orient yourself to the moment determines the failure or fruitfulness of that moment. And this is an excerpt that Maggie read for us. If at 80 you are not a disabled person, if you have your health, if you still enjoy a good walk, a good meal with all the trimmings, if you can sleep without first taking a pill, I can't. <laughs> if the birds and flowers, mountains and sea still inspire you, you are a most fortunate individual and you should get down on your knees morning and night, and thank you, good Lord, for his saving and keeping power. If you're young in years, but already weary in spirit, already on your way to becoming an automaton, it may do you good to say to your boss, and he says, under your breath, of course, forget you, Jack. You don't own me. I love that part. <laughs> If you can fall in love again and again, if you can forgive your parents for the crime of bringing you into the world, if you are content to get nowhere, just take each day as it comes, if you can forgive as well as forget, if you can keep from growing sour, surly, bitter, and cynical, you've got it half licked. For me, Miller is a guy who has some good answers. But the question remains, when are we old? Now I won't get into the weeds of human developmental skills. We all know that Piaget and dozens of psychologists have and can tell you exactly when you're old. Because we want to be definitive and correct. Another way to go at this is asking how do we become, or how do we come to grips with aging so we can bravely excavate our feelings about growing old, dealing with the consequences of aging, and knowing we will someday face the ultimate reality? The reason we practice religion and spirituality is to come to grips with these kind of questions. Why are we here? Who do we belong to? And so forth. Religion is a lifeline that helps us confront the unknown, the unbelievable, and the unspeakable. We humans resist admitting we don't have all the answers. We can search and search, define memory and mortality, but still resist acting on the truth we find. When my mother died on tax day last year, I was filled with gratitude in my heart for how long she had lived, how good a life she had, and how she must have been ready to transition to the other side. She was well past proving she had the stuff of her youth. During one of my last 
real conversations with her right as she was at 95 or 96. I remember her asking me questions about my father who had died almost 20 years earlier. I knew then that her life was gently fading away. On his deathbed, the novelist William Soroyan supposedly said, everybody has got to die, but I always believe that an exception would be made in my case. <laughs> well, 38 years ago, according to deathplot.com, and I commend that website to you if you are brave and courageous. I try to get my wife to look at it, but she she refuses. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and say an exception has been made because my father lived to 77. And deathclock.com insists I will exceed him by two decades. I'm obviously young, as my friends like to say, but if I do check out at 77, they'll be right. And I'm glad that I stopped searching for that missing book. Instead, I invite you to join me saying to the Grim Reaper, forget you, Jack. <laughs> you don't own me. And together we can say, we got it lit. Yeah. Repeat it with me. We got it lit. lit. Amen. Amen. And may it be so. At last, we are worshiping in our refurbished sanctuary, and we're streaming worship services to include as many people as possible. As a community of faith and generosity, we weathered more than a year and a half during which no services were held in person. Many of the church's expenses continued during the last 18 months, and some will increase as we reopen and expand services and programs. It is vitally important for the, con for the ongoing work and health of the church that each of us fulfill our financial pledge. All through the pandemic, this church continued our financial support of organizations identified by our social justice committee as recipients for our Change for Change program. This Porter's recipient is El Calvario Immigration Resource Center, which is located at the El Calvario United Methodist Church. The center provides hospitality for newly arrived immigrants, as well as immigrants living in our county, most of whom were not eligible for pandemic assistance from the government. El Calvario helps them access local resources for housing, health care, legal assistance, and emergency food. In support of recently arrived Afghan refugees, the mission has been expanded to serve as a collection site for donations to the Red Cross, which um, then are delivered to refugees staying at military installations in the region, such as Fort Lissis Donia Anna Village, and Colony Air Force Base near El Boro. You can make your uh, pledge or donate to Change for Change by putting checks and change in the baskets which will soon be passed, by sending your checks to the church, or by using the give link at our website. Please um, remain seated while the collection is taken and Kathy is going to sing soon the day you are ready. Some good things 
or at least amuse the small audience who care enough about us to pay attention. It's time to distinguish the flame. I would um, ask you, after that happens, to please remain seated for the close reading. We extinguish this flame and not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together. Go in peace, but don't fall to pieces. <laughs> <laughs>